Can you just explain a little bit about what your center does? Sure, sure. Yeah, our focus is to try and find out how we're going to mitigate carbon at the scale that's really needed to, uh, to deliver the changes that science says we need. And so our role is to try and figure out the policy options, what will get us there the fastest, what will get us there the most economically, and what will get us there with the greatest environmental impact. Okay. So you, you sort of touched on this already, but what can an analysis provide in terms of the framework here at COP15? Well, as we move forward, uh, a policy is going to obviously be the tool that we're going to use to implement uh, the strategies that come out of a COP process. And so we need to be uh, very thoughtful about the policy options we have, the ones that really work. We can learn from other jurisdictions of things that have worked and also those things that haven't worked so well so that we develop really good policy, hopefully, to get this problem under control quickly. Okay. And is there too much focus on targets? Yeah, in a lot of ways, the COP process, it began a long time ago, so we've been at this for 15 years, COP15, and uh, the focus has been largely around targets. Uh, but over time, we've come to learn that targets have their strengths, but also their weaknesses. It really is a multidimensional problem, and we need to do a lot of different things and excel in a lot of different ways in order to solve this problem. For example, London's uh, congestion uh, pricing has helped to, to, uh, create, uh, to create really serious reductions in carbon in a transport system that otherwise has been the fastest growing source of new emissions. San Francisco has developed a uh, solar uh, rooftop program in which they're uh, diffusing the technology quickly into its population through some very innovative approaches that uh, allow people essentially not to have to pay for all the cost up front, but instead to pay a small voluntary fee each month onto their utility bill. So a very simple but practical but also very effective way. Curitiba, Brazil has developed what's called bus rapid transit. They favor the bus over the car. The bus runs on time. The car doesn't. People get out of the car and they get into the bus. Again, tremendous uh, carbon opportunities uh, that way, carbon reduction opportunities that way uh, through practical policies of that kind. Targets are good, but they don't invent those kinds of ideas. And that's really where we have to go next. That's the second generation debate. Okay, so let's look at some of the different perspectives here. You're obviously a US citizen mm. and you've observed a massive change in terms of your government. Oh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> From a policy perspective, what's happening in the US? Well, I think the, uh, the past uh, eight years of uh, presidency looked backward to find our energy future, looked into the fossil fuel industry and said we need to strengthen that uh, industry and so on. The Obama administration is looking in the other direction. It's looking at the new uh, energy opportunities rather than the old ones in order to try and solve this problem. And that's very encouraging, I have to say, after a long period of time of having to answer to, I think, valid criticism of U.S. policy. Uh, now, finally, we have the opportunity to have a leader that's, uh, I think, going to work with the world community rather than rowing against it as the previous administration did. Okay, and a lot of the talk here at COP15 has been about some of the big hitters, so obviously the US, but also the really big emerging areas like China and India. How are all their fates linked in terms of policy? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, particularly in the US context. Uh, China and India obviously represent uh, fast growing sources of uh, new emissions, and their volume is, is because of large populations and because of the needed economic development in the countries. Uh, their emissions, their volumes are going to go up fairly rapidly. A problem in uh, domestic American politics is that those emissions are seen uh, through a lens that says, why should we, Americans, cut our emissions if the Chinese and Indians are simply going to overwhelm the cuts that we make? That's a delicate political problem that has to be addressed, and uh, the, the, I think this new administration is ready to tackle it on a practical level. While it's true about the volumes, Americans release about 21 tons of carbon dioxide per person per year, and China still clocks in at only about four tons, India at about two tons. So it's going to be difficult in the wider world to say Americans won't cut their emissions until the Chinese and, uh, and uh, India does, when in fact the U.S. is just massively uh, over budget in terms of its per capita emissions and needs to really show that it's serious, that it really is going to cut its emissions. Okay. So I, I also wanted to ask, from your perspective, 
as an analyst, are there any major areas of policy that have been overlooked in terms of this framework here? Yeah, I think partly, I think we're getting closer now. I think the equity issue, I, I can't imagine we're going to get an all-in policy where everybody participates unless we address the equity problem, as I just mentioned, the 21 tons of Americans. Europe is better than, than the U.S. by far, so the U.S. has really a lot of forgiving to do around the world uh, for this. But uh, unless we address that equity problem, I just can't see why uh, countries like China and India are going to join a targets-based regime. And so I, I think the thing that we're still not doing a good job at is working that equity element in, not simply targets, but that we will produce an equity-based uh, framework for, for moving forward.